welcome to any talk today we're going to discuss about the heart cervical collar and its role in trauma patients especially the older patients that would be age group of 65 and above spinal fractures are the third most common traumatic injuries for an older patient that comes after the head and the thoracic out of that 15 percent are cervical spine injuries a frail patient can sustain that injury just from standing up and that is the most common mechanism in uk morbidity and mortality from a spinal fracture in an older patient is 44 percent in one year and this number is eight times greater compared to a younger patient 64 percent of these fractures happen in the upper cervical spine and 45 percent of them are peg fractures and the most scary part of the statistics is 20% of cervical spine fractures in an older adults are asymptomatic. All right, I have a, a friend and a colleague who's joining with me for today's video talk. Uh, it's Dr. Arun. Hi, Dr. Arun. Hi, hi, Noel. Hi, uh, please tell us a little about yourself. So my name is Dr. Arun. Uh, I'm working as a, a ED registrar in one of the Midlands Hospital here in Ireland for the past three years. Wonderful. Awesome. So, you know what topic we're discussing today. We're going to talk about heart collars. Mm -hmm. Are they the right thing to do for a traumatic C-spine injury or suspected C-spine injury in an older adult? Mm -hmm. So, NICE guideline has uh, clearly stated who is the older patient, that is 65 and above. Mm -hmm. So, that's the age group we are targeting today. So, I have five questions for you today and hopefully we try to get an answer out of that. Yeah, um, sure. So the first question I have is, so how do you usually clear a C-spine in ED? Mm -hmm. In ED, normally when you get a polytrauma patient and in whom you need to clear the C-spine, uh, the general principles that we employ is based on the mechanism of injury. Most probably if the patient has arrived to the ED by, by ambulance, they're already on a form of uh, you know cervical spine immobilization most of the times. Um, we also do get some patients who kind of walk into the ED post an RTA. So it, it differs what depending on how they arrive, it depends on what you do next, you know, that kind of way. Um, so taking the patients who arrive by ambulance first, generally when they are already on a three point immobilization or a C collar, uh, you really cannot clear the c-spine clinically because obviously you know uh, you have to do some form of imaging on them because somebody has already taken a decision taken a decision to kind of apply a c-collar so you are you have to kind of go for imaging to rule out uh, c-spine injuries in those kind of patients but it's completely different in patients who sometimes very rarely but who do walk into the ed post uh, you know an injury or a trauma sustained to the neck and in those patients, depending on the history, depending on the high risk, uh, you know, mechanism of injury, we kind of apply some rules. Uh, we can we there the two rules kind of we kind of think about applying certain rules for certain people, and then based on them you decide whether they need to be on collar, or and eventually undergo some form of imaging, or can you clear the C spine clinically? There are certain rules based on certain principles here. This is what we normally Absolutely do. Absolutely right. Yeah. Absolutely right. When they come in a collar, we don't yeah. remove the collar yeah. or we don't... Yeah, that's not what happens in ground zero. Yeah. In reality, it's quite different. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we're we going to talk about all the tools that we have, like the Canadian c spine Nexus yeah. further along. But as you rightfully said, we don't apply when that usually on a patient who just comes on a collar, especially yeah. when they come by the paramedics by the ambulance. Yeah. But um, when they do walk in from the door, yeah. sometimes that gives us a window period to assess by hearing the story and then uh, applying the rules, yeah. so you rightfully said. Yeah. So I had once an 80-year-old gentleman come into ED and uh, he literally <laughs> was gardening and he suddenly got up um, fumbled on the shovel and just landed face first. And he walked into ED, uh, but he did have the uh, neck pain and that's the only complaint. He had no other neurological deficit. Um, and uh, when 
the history was very suspicious and given the age uh, we put a, a immobilizer on her and took him for a scan and surprise surprise he had a pec fracture yeah. so that is quite a, quite a scary thing so as i said in the intro uh, around 20% uh, that's a big number 20% of c spine injuries can present asymptomatically in older patients that's great fine so i have question number 2 for you mm -hmm. so which assessment tools will you use or the ones you know for c spine yeah so basically uh, i'm aware of two kind of well validated scoring or you know rules to clear c spine but in practice i am technically using only the canadian c spine rule the dexa score even though it's far more easier to apply um, it has its own you know kind of uh, uh, drawbacks clinically in practice when you apply the nexus rules but i think in alcoholic patients or who have uh, taken alcohol nexus might be of you know a better tool to apply than canadian c spine but having said that we almost always apply only the canadian c spine rule in our ed in practice so you're absolutely right regarding the canadian c spine because nice recommends uh, the canadian and the nexus but technically in arkham learning there is a, a line that says that canadian c spine is the one they recommend in ed and nexus is more of a pre hospital uh, a quick run through to check the uh, c spine so as you rightfully said c uh, canadian c spine uh, sounds like a plan but now coming to the third main question that is more related to this topic are these two scores validated for trauma c spine trauma c spine as far as i am aware basically canadian c spine is definitely uh, validated but in a particular age group i think so that's why the first line is greater than 65 you cannot apply that rule no, that's only drawback but uh, both of these uh, scoring system uh, have been kind of retrospectively validated in patients who have found to have uh, C-spine injuries. That's uh, as per my knowledge. Yeah. Exactly. So that kind of breaks the whole thing. Is they are validated. They are recommended by NICE and ATLS, and they are validated for alert, adult, alert and stable patients, and for blunt neck traumas. But as you rightfully picked up and said, the very first thing, age group of sixty-five and above. is completely excluded off from the c spine so meaning yeah. that age group falls automatically into high risk so you can't even apply this rule on that age group so we are in a pickle now so that's the big issue yeah. so given that and nexus doesn't have that rule so do you think the nexus can be better option for an older adult so in practice basically what happens is when you get us patient more than 65 years of age uh as i was pointing to earlier in my talk basically if they are already on some form of mobilization you your hands are kind of tied you have to do some form of imaging either ct or x-ray depending on what other injuries the patient has but uh in the other case if these kind of uh, more than 65 years old patients come walking in for some reason to the ed with neck pain post an injury what at right now happens is basically it's a clinical judgment that is applied most of the times um, if the treating physician feels there is a necessity for you know uh, imaging imaging is being done i don't think any particular you know the rules or you know any of the uh, scoring systems are being used right now at least in ireland for this particular subset of people true true yeah. so c spine is more sensitive compared to nexus uh the sensitivity is 100% for canadian c spine and it is 93.4% for nexus uh but the question of nexus being better for older adults uh is the sensitivity when i looked into it it varied significantly it varied from 66 all the way to 100% now that is not good enough then you have such a big range uh, so you can't safely apply that for a particular age group um so what do you think about clinical examination why not then just go back to do 
clinical examinations alone on old models? Do you think that is more effective or will it be effective? It can be up to a certain extent, but um, as you cannot kind of palpate the C1 and C2 properly, even clinically in a patient. Uh, and especially if the patient is on some form of uh, immobilization already, it's very hard in um, practice to palpate uh, clinically the, you know, the first two and the last, last two you can, but you know, generally the first two cervical spines are very hard to uh, palpate clinically, which makes it very hard to clinically uh, suspect a fracture in the first place in those uh, cervical collars. And the way to clinically rule out an injury involves asking the patient to rotate the necks. So mm. if you go into a patient thinking there is a kind of a risk of C-spine injury, uh, is it feasible to ask the patient to rotate his neck for you to clinically rule out an injury when it could potentially exacerbate the problem? It could potentially make him... Uh, lose his strength in his limbs. Mm -hmm. So that's where uh, I think it, it is difficult. It is up to the individual clinician right now. Uh, right now, that's uh, this is the reason that I feel that most of these above 65 patients definitely get an imaging and it's almost never um, ruled out clinically. You know, the cervical spine injury is almost never ruled out clinically. Sounds good, sounds good. So this study that I'm gonna quote down shows that clinical examination sensitivity is around 77%. So not very ideal and not very practical either. Fine. So I'm clear so far. So going, jumping into the fourth question of the day, what immobilization strategy uh, do you commonly use in uh, C-spine suspected injuries? So uh, in adults, it's different. In children, it's different, which is a, quite a new thing, which we also follow in practice. Uh, keeping to adults, generally it is three-point immobilization with some form of hard collar. You know, there are various types of hard collars, but uh, the most commonly used being the Miami J, but you know, there are others as well. So some form of hard collar with uh, tape and blocks is what is basically the most commonly used type in adults. In children, uh, the hard collar is not an absolute necessity. We do follow that if possible and if it's not kind of uh, making the child anxious or if it's comfortable for the children, we can still go ahead and apply, you know, the blocks and tape if the child allows you to. That's what we, we do in normal practice. Mm. All right. So the theory is hot collar, tape it on the forehead, on the chin, three-point immobilization, put them on a trauma mattress. And that's the ideal setup. But in reality, is that what is happening to older patients who's coming into ED? In reality, to older patients, definitely there is quite a bit of variability, you know, in the application of the principles of three-point immobilization. Uh, in most of the patients, and especially in older patients, uh, there could be pre-existing, you know, uh, bone pathology or pre-existing spine pathology, which actually, which makes it very hard to kind of get it perfectly right. So there is a lot of leeway given in elderly patient generally right now, because right now the recommendation is still to apply three point immobilization in adults, even though it has gone away in children. Generally in adults, it's still recommended to apply three point immobilization, even if you're not able to apply it properly. But I know that there is some leeway where it says that if in pre-existing um, you know, if the patient has a pre-existing uh, deformity, you can allow for that deformity. You know, you don't have to correct that. Basically, you can still, um, as much as possible, try to apply the three-point, uh, you know, immobilization principles. Very true. Very true. So, as you said, there is a quite a lot of variability happening ED to ED. So, especially in our ED, we do not force anyone into a hot collar. Uh, the old models I'm talking about. Younger one, yes, they do get one. But as you said, rightfully said, the pre-existing cervical uh, joint issues, uh, spinal issues, we take into consideration and we are very, very cautious in trying to get them, shove them into a hard collar. So this leads me to the next question. Do you think hard collar is efficient for uh, immobilizing a C-spine? Um, the evidence says so, but in my 
personal opinion i think there has to be a you know a newer approach to cervical c spine immobilization because there are quite a few problems associated with the hard collar application you know and it's not so easy to apply it needs a little bit of practice and not only that because of variability in patient's neck size from patient to patient um you have to adjust the collar size which i'm pretty sure many of the physicians do not know about and then it kind of it ends up being put uh the wrong way in many of the cases that i have seen so i do think there needs to be a different alternative to that because of the problems that it causes sometimes all right so you rightfully touched on very very important points that i'm going to address one by one so one talking about the efficiency of a hard collar so this study uh, has concluded saying there is no high level evidence whatsoever that hard collar is doing any good uh, that is it is causing any kind of uh, uh, good prognosis uh, or an outcome for a patient uh, especially putting it in a pre hospital setup um uh this I, this particular topic i slightly touched on my episode 1 is that uh, the cervical collars um Uh, in which i was talking about ed uh, procedures we do that causing pain in which the hard collar fell in moderate to severe category a patient complain putting a hard collar is something that is uh, they consider to be a severe pain it tends to cause a cervical hyperextension and as you said when they have pre existing uh, cervical issues uh, that is not going to end well uh, in fact a lot of uh, some studies have shown this has increased risk of fracture displacement by uh, end up putting them in a hard uh, hard collar for a patient who had an underlying uh, c spine fractures um uh, the other important point that you rightfully pointed out is saying that a lot of people do not actually know how to apply a hard collar uh, in a right way and uh, you're you're absolutely right on that so this study uh, shows that only 11% of emergency practitioners who knew how to adequately put a hard collar 11% that is a significantly sp- a smaller number this might vary from trust to trust and hospital to hospital country to country but then again putting out a number like that uh, was quite um, quite uh, surprising so i recently went to atls to renew my uh, atls course and in that one of the stations is obviously the cervical spine and in one of that is uh, to uh, show how to get the hot collar uh, placed in and i am surprised to see my group uh, quite a lot of people were struggling to measure it and to actually place it and to get it in place um, so um, they were struggling to get that hot collar on and i'm glad atls has a, a station where they are teaching uh, that vital part uh, so that is good to know uh, so the next question the tough question is how do you suppose get a hard collar on a patient who has cognitive impairment or delirious which is two common things we see in an elderly population and you are suspecting a very high level risk that the patient is having uh, a possible underlying cervical spine injury so what will you be your method so in very rare instance uh, if we do get patient like you just um, asked me the question about uh, it is quite possible that i would have to give him some form of mild sedation just for the purposes of applying uh, you know the seat collar if the high su- there is a high suspicion i would definitely go for some form of mild sedation before i can safely apply the collar mm. if the patient is you know kind of unable to tolerate due to his pre existing you know any of the issues that you listed Okay. Okay, that's very interesting. You said uh you might consider a slight sedation for the greater good. Um so this one study has shown that sedation in uh, in a delirious adults and uh has actually has increased inpatient mortality. Uh, uh so yeah, but but again nice guideline does not completely rule it out says uh, you have to uh, balance the benefit and the risk. Uh but I'm just putting this out to say that you know you can't just be very generous in sedating an older patient and uh, just because we want to get something done so we need to be very cautious on these kind of things um so so at the end of the day summarizing from what we have been so far been talking is that hot collar doesn't seem to be a very uh, efficient way to immobilize 
uh, an older patient. A lot of, lot of conflicting studies. A lot of studies have in fact shown the opposite side, saying uh, putting them in a hot collar has caused nothing but trouble. You know, just it's more trouble than benefit. Um, and so because of all this upcoming evidence um, challenging the historical uh, findings, NICE guideline and London uh, major trauma system has updated the guidelines uh, in 2021, saying that now we need to take a, a pragmatic approach. So that is a safer way to say that it's a patient to patient approach. Um, if you can put a collar, that's fine. If you can't, it's okay. You can find other ways to uh, immobilize them. And one other main thing we do not trust, and I'm assuming you do too in yours, would be uh, if you can't put them in a hot collar, do not force anyone into a hot collar, but rather just put uh, immobilize them with blocks. Block them, tape them, and keep, let them keep them in their comfortable position. And then that uh, leads, uh, let's say, uh, less of a struggle for the patient uh, compared to the other point of putting them in a hot collar. So uh, uh, NICE guideline have uh, as actually as updated regarding this point. And that is why I thought it will be uh, uh, more appropriate for us to have a chat regarding on this topic. Um, so, uh, this paper uh, just blandly says do not use hot collar at all in older patients. Um, but then yeah. um, I would rather uh, take the NICE guideline approach and say uh, it's a patient to patient. Uh, uh, so I have seen a very well 80 year old and I've seen a very bad uh, uh, clinically uh, bad 80 year old. So it, it does depend on patient to patient. Um, so who can take it and who can't. So coming to our final Question, uh, question five. So what imaging modality do you prefer to image a C-spine? So um, if uh, the simple answer to that is if the patient needs CT of any other part of the body due to other injuries, it has to be CT C-spine. That's what we use as a rule, basically. But in a uh, small percentage of patients in whom there's suspected isolated neck injury or isolated C-spine injury, um, as of present day guidelines, it is advisable to do three views of X-ray first, and then that's what we use as well. But if any of those three X-rays are inadequate, you know, because sometimes it's hard to get an uh, adequate exposure of uh, you know the lower cervical collars, uh, cervical spines. So in that case, we have to follow that up with, uh, you know, CT scan is what we use. But uh, in elderly, it is difficult. In elderly with pre-existing cervical spine patients, we sometimes kind of, uh, you know, take an individual decision to do CTs. But not in all patients. That's right. what we normally do. And it, one of the main indications in a CTC spine is that inadequate uh, C-spine yeah. x-ray, uh, which is... Yeah. Uh, for uh, God forbid me, but 99.9% uh, .9 of the <laughs> cervical spine x-rays always tends to be inadequate some way or form. Um, so this study has shown that 55.5% um, that of fractures are missed in uh, a cervical spine x-ray and that leading to a sensitivity of only 52%. So that is why uh, grossly they've all moved on. If you want to image a C-spine, just by a CD it. Um, as you said, as you rightfully said, not all patients just comes with an isolated C-spine usually. Um, they always have a, a, a multiple thing going on. Usually they're clubbed with a CT brain. So you, you scan the head, you scan the C-spine along with it, or you, you do a band CT for a trauma and the C-spine gets involved in it. Um, so if you want to image, as of now, CT tends to be uh, the go-to and the gold standard. But then again, uh, there is a uh, a, a comparison that I want to throw regarding a CT and MRI, which is absolutely uh, not something uh, ED has to talk or ED has to get involved in because we have uh, nothing to do with getting an MRI done for a C-spine. But then uh, for just for a, a general uh, broader uh, discussion to completely finish off this topic, CT versus MRI, uh, what do you think? Let's say you have a very advanced C uh, ED and you can get an MRI in an out, out of us, just like you can get a CT, uh, which would yeah. you prefer? 
so the reason for getting imaging in ed on a trauma patient is to look for fractures of the cervical spine uh, that's the f- primary reason we do imaging um i know that in some patients they could have pre- uh, or they could present to you with neurological deficits or you know signs of nerve damage but even in those patients the priority is to look at the you know the fractures because they are post traumatic patients so it is more than 100% likely that it's kind of there is a fragment which is kind of uh, you know pushing on the nerve which is causing the neurological deficit that's what is the most likely cause so as far as looking at bones is concerned ct is the best uh, mri actually can miss some uh, isolated bony you know injuries in a small percentage of patients so i would say ct uh, but in a very small subset of people in whom there is neurological deficit and the ct is normal i would definitely consider mri as a next step fantastic i agree with you 110% ct is the way to go ct or mri it is ct faster quicker and it gives the answer immediately what we are looking for which as you rightfully said fractures are the imaging is an unstable fracture and whatsoever or not and mri is very reserved for let's say uh, a further work up on an abnormal ct or uh, on a very small subset of patient where ct is not able to pick up something has been missed and the mri is picking up because you end up doing that mri because the patient came in with a trauma got a ct that was normal but they still had some kind of a neurological um, development happening in the next few hours and a few days and then those patients get an mri because apparently 15% negative cts had some positivity in a positive finding in mri but that doesn't mean mri is going to overrule a, a ct or that's the first modality ct is always going to be the first modality perfect so mri is reserved for a very small subset of patients as you rightfully said beautiful so i think we have covered all the five major questions regarding this topic and i'm happy with all of the uh, answers we were able to discuss today um so just to summarize uh, do you want to give us a, a, just a quick summary in one or two lines of what we discussed today yeah uh, the quick summary would be basically that um, have a pragmatic approach to you know ruling out these spine injuries especially in the patients who are older than 65 and obviously children we didn't cover children but uh, the rules are different for them as well uh and see collar is not an absolute necessity that's one thing that we need to you know the heart c collar the heart cervical spine collars are not the absolute necessity uh, we could do in some spa- some patients without them as long as you ask the patient to keep the neck in the neutral position if you're not even able you're not even able to put on a you know the blocks you can still just ask the patient to keep the neck you know immobile maybe with the help of somebody but uh, people think that the heart collar is the answer to everything uh, especially you know in a suspected c spine injury but we need to go away from that thinking perfect perfect and thank you for joining me for this uh, episode and hopefully we'll have uh, another episode where we can collaborate and uh, thank yeah. you Arun. thank you thank you very much thank you very much for having me on this episode wonderful and thank you for joining us in this episode of any talk